No, I'm, I'm Matt Gray, and I am, uh, am part of the team at Tabor. Um, of course, like Chris uh, works for BCSA, um, and that's not actually our chief rivalry. Um, in that regard, we're actually, you know, good mates. The, the um, chief rivalry that uh, uh, Chris and I have is baseball. So um, he follows a team called the Astros in America, and I don't. Um, uh, particularly awkward because his team is one of the greatest teams of the last, like, decade. Pretty amazing. They, they just won the World Series last year. Um, but... They're, they're actually not too bad. They're, they'll give his a shake and then lose. Um, uh, but uh, uh, actually, having said that, um, uh, while he was celebrating a World Series win, which is like the greatest baseball co competition in the, the world, um, uh, uh, I don't know if any of you know, but the Adelaide team, the Adelaide Giants, they just won the Australian Championship. Yeah, represent. I was there, which means it's better for me because, like, you weren't in America when the, the Astros won, but I was participating in my, the glory of watching the Giants. I, I actually snuck out after I put my kids to bed and went to the ground and watched the, the, the final glory of it. Um, uh, I got to participate in it as a member of the audience, but, like, you know, like... That counts. Um, uh, uh, and so, um, uh, yeah, part of me actually wants to go down that way of what, what's the value of participating in something rather than just, just watching it on TV or something like that. Um, uh, but before I get to that, I should point out why I wanted to do Witness. That's an easy one. Because does anyone know what Tabor's slogan is? Witnesses to his majesty. That, that has been our slogan the whole time that we've been around. It's actually based on um, a passage from 2 Peter, uh, verses, uh, chapter 1, verses 16 to 18. And it says, For we did not follow, follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. So wit um, uh, uh, he says we're not, we're not following you know, cleverly devised myths, we're witnesses to his glory. Now, Part of the reason why I think that ended up being our slogan is because traditionally the, um, the mountain that is associated with that key event. So anyone know what the event is that Peter's talking about there? It's the Transfiguration, right? So um, traditionally the Transfiguration took place, on, uh, is identified as having taken place on Mount Tabor in Israel. And that's why we're called, Mount, we're called Tabor. Um, uh, and this... This whole idea of witnessing to his glory, you know, witnessing to his majesty, is a really interesting one for me because, it, first of all, like, what actually is this kind of majesty that he's talking about? Well, he's talking about when, when it's not just that Jesus is shining, it's that he's revealed as utterly invincible, all-powerful, fully divine, glorious, magnificent, all that kind of stuff. And Peter's kind of remembering seeing that. Um, now, that idea of witnesses to his majesty, well, of course, this is where Palm Sunday comes in for me a little bit, because... Palm Sunday is another event on a much lesser scale, you might suggest, of Jesus being revealed in majesty. He's revealed as being a king. And it'd be interesting to ask Peter, which was more impressive? Was it seeing Jesus being glorified with all the white stuff, you know, being all shiny and everything like that? But you, only three of you get to see that. 
But then you get to see him walking in on the donkey and you've got everyone yelling out and cheering. I'll read that out for you, actually. Um, uh, This is from uh, Mark. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent... Oh, Mark 11, if you're following along. Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. And as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. And when they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, he sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they'd cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. Imagine the experience of witnessing that. Imagine imagine how it would feel to to be walking along in that context, to smell the smells, hear the hosannas, to, um, to, to almost feel the crowd. I mean, this is why it's better to be at the Giants um, in Adelaide winning with like 2,500 people rather than watching 40,000 people um, uh, when the, the Astros are winning in America with all due respect, Chris. Um, uh, because, like, the, the difference is, there's one thing to wit- witness in terms of just watching it, but to participate in it, to feel the crowd, to feel that, 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 that comes with a weight, you know, like a, a, a presence to it all. And, and to feel the sense of, victorious hope that Jesus represents for those people in that moment. The sense of, this is our king who's coming in. Now, they're all going to, you know, change their mind on that pretty quick during that week, but in that moment, it must have felt amazing. It must have been euphoric, not just for Jesus, but for the disciples coming in. We can think of our life as being uh, like defined by those moments, the win moments, the moments where we um, are witnesses to his majesty, where Jesus is doing something really great through like a church, having a revival or, you know, someone coming to Christ in front of you or being at a, a camp or something like that where everyone's like really you know just switched on or or whatever it could be or like me you know the time where I'm in a class and I actually have a student who gets it you know those kind of rare golden moments in a lecturer's life Um, uh, uh, and, and we can think that those are the moments that that matter it's interesting actually though but um Peter when he describes this 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 experience of witnessing Christ's majesty on the cross, uh, 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 on the mountain, actually, he uses a, a very rare word, hypoptis. Hypoptis, um, which, mean, it, which does mean witness, but it's very rare. Like it, it, I think it's used like once in the Bible, it, and, and it's not very common in other places. Right? There's another word for witness that is used much more commonly throughout the New Testament all over the place, right? Um, In fact, Peter himself uses it in 1 Peter, in chapter 5. He says, To the elders among you I appeal to a fellow... I I appeal to you as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's uh, sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So I'll say that again. 
1 Peter 5.1, to the elders among you I appeal as a fellow elder and as a witness of Christ's sufferings who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So there he uses the word witness again, but he doesn't use the same word for it. He actually uses a word that lots of other people do. Now the context of that is he's about to tell the elders some stuff they don't want to hear, but it's interesting what he uses as the uh, qualification to be able to say that kind of a hard thing. And it's witnessing Christ's suffering. Now, the thing about the, the, um, uh, the word he uses for witness there is it's not epoptes. It's a different one. Um, it's actually a word that is very common in the Bible. Um, it's used in the New Testament in various, various forms, like as a verb, as a noun, over 200 times. They use it all the time, all the time. And that is the word matis. Matis. And that's where we get the word martyr. So the word that we have, martyr, actually comes from the Greek word for a witness. And notice that in 1 Peter, it is not a witness to... His majesty. It's not a witness to Jesus doing a victory dance or winning the World Series. All right? It's not a witness to victory. It is a witness to Christ's sufferings. That's the criteria by which he can go to town on the elders. Is I saw Jesus die. But it's not just that. It's that he is a witness to Christ's sufferings, but kind of linked in with that, intrinsically linked in to that for him, is that, that because he is a witness to Christ's sufferings, he gets to be a partaker in the glory that is to come. Okay? Um, uh, the word there for um, partaker um, is uh, kinonos. And kinonos, uh, some of you might know the word koinonia. Um, uh, that, um, that's a, one of those ones that people bandy around a fair bit. Kinono. Uh, and kinonia, um, in Greek, it doesn't just mean... Um, the new, the new, new International is really irritating there. They call it sharing. You know, I, share, I share a chip packet with my sons, like, you know, sharing. Like, no, it's not that. It's much more participatory. It's much more um, partnership. Um, it's, it's sharing the profits. You know, it's, it's feeling a connection with everyone else. It's, it's actually more intimate than that. Right? So, when Peter was on Mount Tabor and he's in the transfiguration, there's actually a, that, that, that isn't a participatory experience in the same way. He can't participate in it. He's an audience. He, like, have you ever noticed that about that story? He's, he is a witness to it, but he's a witness like, well, when Chris was watching, it on, uh, watching the World Series on TV, he can't participate in it in the same way. He can just watch. I'm really going to town with you, man. It's, it's really fun, actually. Um, so, uh, like, the, yeah, you did win. So, like, yeah. And, but that's actually kind of my point. It's good. Like, it's great to see your team win. It's great to see Jesus being transfigured. But you're just kind of sitting there. Like, the one time where Peter actually says, hey, can I participate in this too? He sucks. Like, he has no idea what to do. And, and so, like, God just basically tells him to shut up. Like, just sit back and just watch, man. That's all you got. Okay. But then you contrast that, you contrast that with how when he's witnessing 
Like, first of all, in Palm Sunday, like we were saying, he's there. He's in it. He's walking alongside. It's his, he's got the cult. He went and got it. You know? Like, he, it's his cloak that Jesus' butt is sitting on. Right? He's potentially leading the donkey in. He's hearing that and he knows that when everyone is cheering Jesus, they're looking at him too and they're going, hey, I'm with him, just so we know. I'm with him. Okay? Which means he does partake in Jesus' glory in that moment. So it's a different kind of witnessing. It's a witnessing where you're, you're in it and you, and you share in it. Right? And in a similar way, that's what martyr came to mean for the early church throughout the, the next 200 years as they were like beaten, beaten, being beaten up by the Romans all the time. See, it wasn't enough that they were Baptists, just watching. It wasn't enough that they just watched. Right? To be a martyr was not to just watch Jesus die. It was to participate in his sufferings. To be a witness in a way that intrinsically linked you up with that. It's, it wasn't just dying for Christ, as if you die for him, but like, you know, dying for the Christmas, Christian faith. It wasn't to die for him. It was to die like him, almost kind of like a virtual reality tour. Like, you know, um, I remember a few years ago, I had a student who, um, Blackwood uh, Baptist, they did this thing where they actually, during Easter, they got someone to, um, one of their congregants, to walk across, like walk an actual cross through the town main road. And I asked him afterwards, what was that like? And he said it was one of the most profound spiritual experiences of his life. Because in that moment, he understood what Jesus had gone through just a little bit more. He saw it differently. He saw it differently. He felt it differently. He participated in it differently. And that's what it was like for people who got martyred in the first couple of centuries. They felt it differently. Um, uh, and, And that's why people who came to die for their faith, became called martyrs. Why would they be called that? Why weren't they called people who died? Why weren't they called something else? They were called martyrs because they were witnesses. And they weren't called epoptes, right? An audience. They were called people who really witnessed, who really saw what was going on. And that actually comes out a lot in the stories of that time. So I'm a church historian. What are you going to you kind of get to get this kind of stuff from me? Um, so uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, a bishop from the time called Polycarp, Polycarp from Smyrna. Um, now, pretty impressive dude. His um, spiritual father, his mentor, was John the Apostle. Just as a quiet little aside. Imagine name dropping that as a par- at, at a party. Yeah, you know, I was mentored by John, the disciple who Jesus loved. Um, uh, but um, what happened with Polycarp was he was he was born in like what 69 AD, and then um, uh, uh, became this incredibly uh, successful pastor, bishop kind of guy. Um, he actually received a personal letter from another martyr. Um, called Ignatius of Antioch. And uh, uh, Ignatius, Ignatius' story is interesting. What happened with Ignatius was that um, uh, he got 
charged with being a Christian in Antioch and then the emperor of the time actually sent him on basically a national tour to get him to, to Rome and then he was fed to lions. Right? In kind of like the precursor to the, the, um, the, um, the Colosseum. But along the way, he stops off on the tour and speaks to all of these different churches so he does like an evangelistic tour on his way to being executed. It's really weird. And he wrote letters to different people along the way, Ignatius. Um, one of the fun things about Ignatius is that when he gets to the last letter, the last letter is to the Romans. And he'd found out that the Roman church was going to try to spring him. They were going to try to get him out of being martyred. And his entire letter is, don't. Don't. I don't want you to do that, right? I, I don't want you to um, uh, spring me. He says, do me no untimely kindness. You know, don't do me no favours, basically, right? Ignatius says, I'm, I'm actually really excited about this process of dying because I'm going to die anyway. He's an old man by this point. I, I'm going to die one way or the other. What I want is the opportunity to participate in Christ's sufferings so that I may participate in his glory, that I can truly understand what Jesus went through is this amazing opportunity that I've been given. All right, so I'm, I'm off. Now, the other thing is that there's uh, all of the letters, there's seven letters, six of those letters are written to churches. There is one letter that is written to a person, just one person, and that's Polycarp. And it's all about, you got a job to do. You're a pastor. Watch what I'm doing. Because your time may come, my friend. And then Polycarp's day comes. His time does come. So Polycarp was hiding at a farm when, the, um, when he found out that he was uh, uh, going to be... Um, arrested. So he's hiding on the farm and, the, uh, and then he has a dream and he has this dream of his pillow that he's sleeping on be, being burned up and he gets a voice that says to him and that's what's going to happen to you. Get ready. Then he's um, betrayed and he's betrayed um, uh, by one of his dearest friends. And he's handed over to a, the chief constable, the, the main policeman, whose name is Herod. Polycarp doesn't escape. He could have. Instead, he invites his people in and makes them lunch. And says, basically, how you doing? Do you mind if I just take a couple of hours to pray first and then we can be on our way? Enjoy the meal. And he goes off, prays, um, and uh, 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 they were so impressed with him, they actually apologised as they took him. It was kind of like, you know, sorry, but we really need to leave to execute you. <laughs> you know, if, you, if you'd come this way, please. You know, that kind of thing. So um, uh, then he was brought to trial. And the governor who is trying him is completely feckless. He's useless. He's, he's a puppet of the crowd. The crowd yell out. And this guy is trying desperately to get um, Polycarp to just, just buckle. And he can't understand why. He's like, you, could, you don't have to be executed today. He says, what harm is there in you sacrificing to the gods, just like we do. You don't even need to mean it. Just go ahead and do it. It's no big deal. I don't want to execute you today. It's the crowd that want to execute you. And Polycarp's response is, I've been worshipping Jesus for 86 years. Do you really think on this day I'm going to stop now? Like, really? Then the crowd come to him, and the crowd yell out. And they say, because he's denying all of the Greek gods, they say to him, down with the atheist because he's denying their gods. And so you know what he does? He says, 
yeah, down with the atheists. And he yells it out to them because they're not, rever- they're not believing in the true God. And then um, uh, they, um, they continue to like shout out to him and uh, 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 the, the, they become frustrated. And so they say to the governor, take him, take him. And they take him to the stadium. And at the stadium, they try to feed him to animals. And the animals won't eat him. <laughs> they won't bite. And it becomes really awkward because he's just like, hey, what up? Um, uh, and uh, uh, so finally, in desperation, they do exactly what he'd been, he felt the prophecy was back with the pillow. They grab him and they put him on a pyre. And the weird thing was they didn't use chains. Usually you used chains. But in this case, they just used ropes because he didn't struggle. He was like, I'll take it, I'll do it. So they tie him to this post, slightly elevated. And he stands there and he waits for them to get the fire going. And they get the fire going. But then none of the flames actually lick him. They kind of blow out a little. And this becomes really awkward now because they still kind of like burn him. It's getting really uncomfortable. So finally what they do is they stab him through the heart and that's how he dies. You know, third time's a charm, right? Uh, And it's his blood splurting out, the water in his blood splurting out of his body and that douses the fire. Isn't that an amazing story? Now, it's an amazing story of courage and everything like that, but I'm sure as you went along, you saw little resonances, little things that reminded you of another story of a person being executed, didn't you? All right? You saw little... The Herod reference, the betrayal of a, of a good friend, the going calmly there, the feckless governor who can't bring himself to execute him, tries to get him off in every way, but he's a, um, a pawn of the crowd. The crowd cheering vehemently, but not being able to get their own way until they do. His courage in, the, in death. All, right? all these things. See, Polycarp is not just a bystander. Polycarp is not just a sit and watch it on TV. Polycarp is a person who is a true martyr. He's witnessing in and with and through Jesus. And and that's kind of where I, I want to kind of leave you. Because this works both ways. It's not enough for us to be witnesses to his majesty, to wait for the victory dance. The way we participate in his glory is by participating in his sufferings, being a true witness. And that real witness comes through not just seeing, but actually walking along in it, feeling it, and sensing him in it. Now, you and I are probably not going to get martyred in the same way. I hope for just a second you actually feel a pang of jealousy about that just for a moment. Just a pang of jealousy that you don't get what Polycarp and Ignatius got. You don't have to hold on to that for too long. It's okay. But the early church got to a point where they stopped talking about what they called red martyrdom and they talked instead about white martyrdom. And that was where when we embrace the sufferings and the challenges of our day, when we feel that we are suffering for Christ, that we're not just suffering for him, but that we are suffering with him and through him. And that might be present in like persecution and stuff, but it might also be 
in the presence of suffering for your family when you're just trying to raise them right and they won't put on their damn pants in the morning and you are just trying to get them ready because you're just trying to be a good dad or a good mum and you're trying to, you know, raise them right. There is suffering there, my friends. I, I feel it with you all, my brothers and sisters who are parents. Or it might be in the suffering of making a hard decision at work that no one else will make because it's the Christ-like thing to do. It might be the suffering of staying late that one time because a friend really needs you to when you've got work in the morning and it's going to cause you pain, but you do it anyway. And why do you do it? Because you are following Jesus. It might be in any of those moments to think about those moments as a little white martyrdom, a little moment where you are witnessing not just to Christ to those people, but you are witnessing with and like and, you know, through Christ with you. You know, often we talk of martyr in our culture as being a bad thing in terms of like, gosh, they're being a bit of a martyr about, you know, washing those dishes or that kind of thing. I want to reframe that for you. You are a martyr when you participate with Christ through the challenges of your day because Christ is with you in those moments. 